it is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher. Jesus' great will for us is to become like him. That's why he took on our human nature. That's why he entered the world. That's why he's given us the sacraments. That's why he's given us the word of God. And he wants us to have that desire to become just like him, chips off the old divine block. For the last five days, Jesus has been instructing first the apostles and then all of us throughout time about going forth with his message. It began when he said, pray to the harvest master for laborers for his harvest, and they did. And as they were praying, Jesus said, I will take you and you and you and you, and he chose the 12. He sent them out with his own authority, with his own message, with his own capacity even to raise the dead. Then he sent them out with his own packaging. Jesus himself was totally trusting in his father's providence. So he said, don't pack a suitcase. Don't pack a second change of clothes. Don't carry a money bag. Trust in the same father who was cared for me. Wish peace to everyone you meet. Don't wait to find if they're peaceful. Start by offering them peace because you'll be surprised who receives you. Even if you suffer rejection, don't carry that resentment with you to the next place. Instead, just wipe it off as dust from your feet so that you're able to carry me and my message and my kingdom to the next town rather than your wounds. Yesterday, Jesus described how he would permit us to become sculpted like him, just like Jesus suffered for bringing the message from both civil and ecclesiastical authorities. So Jesus himself said that we would similarly be dragged before courts, into synagogues, before kings and rulers on account of his name. And today he continues that message. Despite that, he says, don't be afraid of a thing. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, the prince of devils, what will they say of those of his household, his family members? They're going to say the same wicked, false things about us. Therefore, don't be afraid of them. He tells us, everything that's now hidden will be brought into the light. Our fidelity, others' infidelity, will all be exposed. So he says, what we see in the dark especially in quiet times of prayer, announce in the light what we hear whispered to us interiorly. Proclaim it from the housetops. Jesus is alive. Jesus lives. He tells us not to be afraid of even rulers who all they can do is kill the body but can't touch the soul. He says, really, have a holy awe for the only one who could destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Don't care about the threats that people will give. Care far more about pleasing your father. And then he describes that father, the father who has counted all 130,000 follicles some of us still have on our head. That father who cares for these cheap sparrows. You could buy two of them for a penny, and often they'd throw in another just because they weren't worth anything. But if they're not worth anything to people here, how much they're worth to the Father. He knows everyone and won't allow one to fall to the ground and injure itself. He cares for us so much more. And then he finishes by saying there's no need to be afraid. You're worth more than hundreds. The theme of this Eucharistic Convention is take courage. I have conquered the world. I have overcome the world. We're able to take courage because Jesus doesn't just mouth these words to us in instruction saying, do what I say. We can take courage because Jesus always waves to us with a gloriously transfigured hand and says, come follow me. Do exactly as I do. And if we acknowledge him before others, he will acknowledge us forever before the Father. What an incredible promise. What an incredible hope. We've got three examples today of this type 
of following the master. The first was in anticipation, the patriarch Joseph in today's first reading. This is something that anticipates the parable of the prodigal son. After his brothers had sold him into slavery, after they had actually treated him as if he were dead, and God used that to save him. They went to their brother after Jacob died, just like the prodigal son with a rehearsed speech. Let us be your slaves. And Joseph would have nothing of it because they were his beloved brothers, even though they had betrayed him. One of the most important ways we need to imitate Jesus, who is mercy incarnate, is by becoming merciful like he is merciful. And Joseph shows us how that's done. The second great witness today on July 13th is Saint Henry, the Holy Roman Emperor. Even though he was king, he considered himself far more importantly as a servant of the King of Kings. And he sought to use his realm and all his authority precisely to establish Christ's kingdom founding monasteries, founding even a whole diocese, and setting the type of example following Jesus in which everyone in his realm would be able to say, I want to be like the king whose great desire is to be like the king born in a stable in Bethlehem. And the third great witness is the one who imitates Jesus most closely, the one who acknowledges him most powerfully, Our Lady, whom we remember in a special way on this Saturday. Her whole life was a reflection and an anticipation of Jesus' life. Take courage, Jesus says. Acknowledge me before the Father. And when Mary was met by the Archangel Gabriel as a tiny little kid, a teenager in Nazareth, and the Archangel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, Yeshua. God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. Mary shows us the response of courage. She says, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Today, as we prepare to receive the same Jesus from this altar, that she carried within her womb for nine months. We ask her to pray for us, that we might similarly take courage and present ourselves before Jesus as his true servants and do what he tells us in today's holy word. Praise be Jesus Christ.